Good afternoon, Eastern Washington. This is Matt Shea, and welcome to Patriot Radio, broadcasting live from the capital of free Washington, Spokane Valley, brought to you once again by the committee to elect Matt Shea, Republican, in the legacy of Dr. Stan Monteith, bringing you the story behind the story and the news behind the news. It's not about right and left. It's about right and wrong. And I want to talk at the start of this new year. First of all, Happy New Year. We do, we do need to make sure that we keep our hope in Jesus Christ, not in man, but that we don't end with prayer. We move to action. And too often, I have seen in this last year, a lot, a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians who will talk about things or they attend church. It's almost as if it's like a classroom. They leave on Sunday, they go home, and really nothing changes. And if you, you know, I've sat in front of a couple of audiences and I've asked, you know, how many of you have led somebody to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? And the response was anemic. And I think that's putting it politely. You know, love is not just talking about it. It's getting out there in the community. But by the same token, we can't just, you know, feed somebody. I mean, we have to develop relationships with them. We actually have to show them love and pray with them, get to know them. And I want to highlight this passage from Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So we were crucified with Christ, but we're also made alive with Christ. And then it says this, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you understand what that means? We are seated with Jesus Christ in heavenly places if we are in him and he is in us. He sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. Physically, here in this earth, we are spiritually with the Lord in heavenly places. But are we acting like that? Because it also says in Scripture that everything is put under his feet. And if he is sitting at the right hand of God on the throne, if he's there and we're seated with him, everything's under our feet as well. And why are we not acting like that today? There's a video recently, actually it was maybe a few months ago actually, of a lady up in Alaska who has a bear come after her kayak. And all she screams is at the bear is, bear, stop doing that, bear, don't eat my kayak. Bear, you should be sleeping. And it's, it's fairly hilarious. But are we living our lives as Christians like that lady yelling at the bear? Or are we actually going out and taking care of the problem? You see the difference? One is walking in power. One is not. One is kind of hoping. And again, if we, if we get the identity of sonship in Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, that is the gospel of the kingdom. If we understand that the church is unstoppable, and what we see today is an anemic, anemic church. And it, it crosses everything into politics, into everything. And I, wanna, I wanted to take a minute to talk about this because for me, And probably for many of you, you're frustrated. 
You might have a good pastor who's, who's preaching the word. You might even have a good teacher in the church and what, you know, there's great Wednesday service for Bible studies. You might even have people that are evangelizing on the street in your church. But boy, if you go to the other two parts of the fivefold ministry, <laughs> wow. And then if we do evangelize people, are we actually bringing them in and discipling them? I remember from my Christian walk, nobody told me, no one told me about water baptism or about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Nobody told me about it. I had to find out reading it. Nobody mentioned, I mean, it it was kind of like, you know, the Lord, I come to a point, the Lord would point it out to me in my life. And the Holy Spirit is faithful to do that. If you're reading, you're in the Word, you're praying, you're listening, you're obeying, Holy Spirit is faithful to do that. But where was the disciple? Where is the discipleship? I, we just don't like talking about the Holy Spirit. Because that can really upset some folks. Well, it is either the Numa. The Ruach in Hebrew, the breath, the wind of God that is written about in Scripture, or it's not. And if it's there, why aren't we talking about it? Why aren't we talking about the power of God in our present time? How he's been able to work through people, to bless others. And how we each should not just be talking about this, we should be out there living it. So I hope that spurs you to conversation, especially with your families. It's not just learning about the word, learning the truth. It is about walking in the spirit. The scripture is very clear to walk in the truth in the spirit. And we're doing one and not really the other. I mean, are we obeying every moment of every day what we're being called to do? And I think if we did, not only would we we be a different country, not only would we be a different country, but God and our experiences with God would be different in our daily lives. I was reading The Paradigm by Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, and one of the great quotes in there is, if we live in the times of Elijah, now think about that. That was Ahab and Jezebel's time, great evil in the land, child sacrifice. Hmm, is that happening today in America? Yes, through abortion. You had massive and rampant sexual immorality. And it wasn't just, you know, relegated to one corner of the population. It was actually promoted from the highest levels in government at that time. And so Khan's idea was if we're living in the times of Elijah, then we need to be the Elijah of our times. We need to be that beacon of truth, hope, light. The Lord is working through us and can work through us in very powerful and miraculous ways as well. It's not going to be politics that fixes our problems. It's going to be Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the international front in your daily intelligence briefing in the Middle East. Interesting. We've been talking about the aligning that is occurring and the Egypt, Saudi, UAE block versus Iran Turkey trying to reassert its reassert and, and insert itself wherever it can as kind of the true Sunni country. Interesting though, Jordan's King Abdullah. Now, if you're if you're familiar with the Middle East, you'll understand that you had the Saudi Kingdom, the Saudi Royals, and you had the Hashemite Kingdom. Now, the Hashemite Kingdom is what is now modern-day Jordan, and the Heshemite kingdom used to be the stewards of Mecca until they were kicked out by the Saudis. 
Now, what you are are seeing is part of this realignment is a restaking of old claims and reassertion of old rights. When Jordan Jordan's King Abdullah comes out and essentially proclaims himself, quote, the servant of the first Qibla and third holy mosque. What that is saying is he is the true steward of Islam. So you have the Heshemite kingdom reasserting its role after it had been kicked out by the Saudis as a true steward because they are asserting the Saudis are becoming too moderate. So now Turkey throwing a wrench in there with the aligning. Jordan throwing a wrench in there with King Abdullah saying that. And I also want to say this too. King Abdullah is considered more of a moderate Muslim. And it doesn't stop the fact that he believes what he believes and is going to act on those beliefs. And I think it's important to understand the Middle East. They act on their beliefs and their heritage and culture. And they could go a generation. They could go two generations. They could go two centuries. And they will still remember what their right and their obligation was, and they can reassert it later. So it's important. That they, they view things generationally and historically, and that's what we're seeing in the Middle East today with this aligning. Also, I talked about the Palestinians being rebuked by the Saudis and the UAE for attacking Donald Trump. Israel and the United States agreeing on a strategy with Iran as well. But I want to stop at the Palestinian part. Donald Trump considering cutting off aid to the Palestinian Authority, among other countries. Great, finally, we're not giving money to our enemies. But it's part of this rebuke by the Saudis and the UAE. Trump is following it up with, hey, we're considering pulling the funding. So we're, you may see a, a dramatic shift by the Palestinians in their position. You may not. And I hope Trump follows through with his promise. Also on the international front in the Middle East, Iran, massive, massive protests occurring there. Um, you, you get 21 dead in the, the latest protest. Massive strikes, a general strike called for um, today, Tuesday over there. Uh, the regime vowing it's going to crack down on the foreign dissidents, as they're trying to call them. So a lot happening there, and obviously there are intelligence resources <laughs> at work and monitoring in Iran. So uh, I don't think this is going away anytime soon. I think these protests are going to grow, and you're going to see them grow in the Middle East. Also on the international front, North Korea and South Korea, some peaceful overtures ahead of the Winter Olympics. We'll see if that holds. They did not do another nuclear test, even though U.S. assets were spun up, and maybe that's why they didn't do a nuclear test by the end of the year. But in this new year, sometime, somewhere, they're going to try to push the envelope again, the North Koreans. They're just going to try to do it. Will it be during the Olympics? I don't know. Um, it's not unheard of of communist dictatorships to use the Olympics for political purposes and to send messages. Also on the international front, Venezuela, children suffering from failed socialist policies, according to a report down there in the emergency rooms of the hospitals in Venezuela. It's just a horrible situation. Please pray for those folks down there as well. Um, but... Some of the mainstream media here in America not acknowledging that it is actually socialism that is the problem. Well, they just didn't do their socialism right. No, centralization of control ends up in an oligarchy or a few people controlling or pulling the strings. And they, they cannot react to market forces faster than the market can of individual transactions. They just can't. And so it ends up resulting in massive hardship. This is the history of modern Western civilization going back three, 400 years. And it goes back obviously farther than that. But people should know 
the lesson out of this. Socialism does not work and children end up getting hurt. Also on the international front, Hungarian Christmas message. Now, I, this actually, um, this made my heart smile. Um, Victor Orban, I've talked about him uh, on the show before, but his Hungarian Christian Christmas message was, quote, we'll protect Christian culture, not retreat behind concrete blocks and watch our women harassed on New Year's, end quote. And it gets even more interesting than that. He called on Europeans to protect their Christian culture and vowed Hungary, again, would not retreat. Quote, Christian, Christianity is culture and civilization. We live in it. It is not about how many people go to church or how many pray honestly. Culture is the reality of everyday life. Christian culture defines our everyday morals. End quote. Wrote the wonderful Victor Orban. And this coming to us from Breitbart, just another example of how Hungary and Poland are pushing back, which brings us to the next thing. The EU super state is now being punished by Poland. So the European Union is cracking down on Poland claiming the nation's conservative government is interfering with the judiciary system. Now, here's what here's what happened. Poland's governing law and justice party is pushing reforms to remove leftover judges of the communist regime. There was no de-communism of their court system. And so the Poles are like, hey, look, we're, we're going to change this. We're going to reform it, and we're going to get rid of the communists off the bench. Makes sense, right? Well, now the European Union has triggered Article 7, which forces them, them being Poland, to consider that they're in a serious breach of the founding principles of the European Union. Well, what does that mean? So the founding principles of the European Union are to defend communism? You guys got to check this article out. It's on World Net Daily. Uh, but Poland and Hungary really pushing back hard in Europe. And uh, starting to run into the European super state. And you can kind of see where their very clear allegiances lie with the European Union. Defending communism and the destruction of the sovereignty of countries. Also on the national front, redneck revolt. We talked about this last week. Communists, admitted communists arming themselves. Some people got all bent out of shape about it. But admitted communists are arming themselves in America. And historically, that means that they're going to attempt a revolution. That's what communists do historically. Okay. Now, Redneck Revolt tries to hide it under all this words and stuff. But the fact is, you have admitted communists arming. Okay? That's what's happening in America. And these same people admit that... They want to over, quote, overthrow capitalism, end quote, that they want to overthrow the Constitution. So that's not American. And if that's the case, then we need to take them seriously. And there are a lot of people say, oh, yeah, try it. You guys, you guys never get never do anything. Look, at remember that. The Russian Provisional government did not take seriously the Bolsheviks in 1917 because they were so extremist. There's just no way that they would ever take power. And look what happened. We have to take these things seriously. Also on this same front, Trump is putting the word jihad Back in intelligence circles. Uh, I know that sounds kind of small, but it's huge, actually. Because it had been taken out by the Obama administration and really, I think, led to a, a false analysis of the threats that the United States faces. So Trump putting it back in there. A lot of people excited and happy about that. Very privately in the intelligence community. People are saying, hey, it's about time. We can actually give clear 
analysis. All right, also on the national front, this is kind of a a neat story coming to us, and it's coming to us from CBS New York, okay? So, So those of you who say that don't ever quote mainstream media, I'm quoting them on this one. Scientists have found an Alzheimer's treatment while trying to cure diabetes. Now, you guys got to take a look at this online. Read the article for yourself. But what they, and these are researchers at Lancaster University, have found that this drug being tested for diabetes patients significantly reversed memory loss in test subjects, and is now being examined as a possible treatment for neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's. So, wow. They're, they're stopping short of saying it's a cure, but they're saying that this has had a pretty tremendous result in treatment. So many of you out there that have family members, you should take a look at this article again coming from CBS New York. CBS New York. Also on the national front, Roy Moore made the charge of voter fraud. Politico has the story. Politico is saying that the case was thrown out, and so uh, Moore cannot proceed. But he had three experts that he cited in there, alleging on a more likely than not standard that there was voter fraud. So very interesting that that got tossed. Also on the national front. Now, we have talked a while back about this, but it's called the Maunder Minimum. It is a lack of sunspots for a prolonged period of time. And according to data from NASA's space weather, so far in 2017, 96 days of the days observed have been without sunspots. And so we are approaching a Maunder Minimum. What does that mean? Okay, in in plain language, the Earth is cooling, okay? There is global cooling very likely on our horizon and in our future. And you can take a look at that at whatsupwiththat.com, and uh, they collect a lot of data on the global warming stuff, and this just coming out. Facts are facts. Looks like it's cooling. Also on the national front, this coming from NBC News. An outage at Custom and Border Protection leads to long lines at airports. Okay, what does that mean? It means that their standard in-processing technology could not d- distinguish between U.S. citizens and non-U.S. citizens. And that this outage affected was nationwide, apparently. Okay. Now, this comes on the heels of that weird incident at the Atlanta airport where there's a fire and there's power outage. comes after the weird incident of the Amtrak derail, which they still haven't really announced, at least to the legislative circles, what the cause of that ostensibly was. So now we have this airport outage of the Customs Border Patrol. Very, very, very interesting. On the regional front, I'd like to talk about a couple things here. Drudge Report, and also InfoWars, but I'm going to take InfoWars. Court upholds a $135,000 fine for bakers who refuse to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex ceremony. This is that case called Sweet Cakes. Um, This is back from uh, February 2013. But uh, an Oregon court has upheld the decision forcing two bakery owners to pay a $135,000 fine refusing to bake a wedding cake and participate in a ceremony against their will. It's unreal. That is not religious freedom. The constitutions of the 50 states have religious liberty protections. This is a huge deal because what this means is that Christians are actively being persecuted in the United States of America. Many of you probably already know that, understand that, but it if that's the case then you can no longer ignore politics 
You can no longer ignore it. Also on the regional front, out of Nevada and the Bundy Ranch trial, mistrial was declared a full dismissal or, or a mistrial with prejudice is being considered on January 8th. Also, Attorney General Sessions has begun an investigation. Had some rumors coming out of Nevada that the Department of Justice was down there actually investigating last week. We haven't confirmed that. And maybe down there this week. We don't know. But either way, January 8th is the date. Uh, pray there for a resolution. And I will keep you informed of what happens down there as well. Also, the regional front session is starting next week. We're heading over to Olympia on the 8th. And I want to highlight a couple things. So Attorney General Ferguson here in Washington, one of the, the most activist with, I mean, without question, activist attorney generals in history of Washington state. He is proposing a bunch of anti-freedom, anti-gun initiatives, among others. And I want to go through a couple so you know what we're facing here. But if you have not heard of him or what he's been doing, then you need to get educated because his activism is really the single greatest threat we have to liberty here in Washington State for the next foreseeable future. First of all, he wants to try to overturn the death penalty. Then he wants to do this assault, we- so-called assault weapons ban. No, but it's more than that. He's talking about moving the age, okay, the purchase age for a so-called assault weapon, which the way that they had it defined would include a, a lot of what you would probably not consider an assault weapon. Everything's in the definitions on these things, but wants to increase the purchase age from 18 to 21. So you could be a United States military active duty soldier and not be able to purchase the same firearm you were training on. Okay. On top of that, he wants to look at a 10, you know, limiting magazine capacity to 10 rounds. He also and this is not in here, but when we read the bill last year, it was in there. Wants to have a magazine registry where you would register your magazines and ostensibly maybe even have a background check done just to buy a magazine. So this is among many other things he's trying to do, but those are probably the worst. We need to be involved this session. And if you haven't ever been to... Freedom Agenda Washington on Facebook. We post a lot of action items there. Also on my Facebook page of what is happening this week. We will also be giving you live updates Tuesdays of what is happening in the legislature and what you can do about it. So we need to pay attention. Which brings us also to the Hearst situation. There is a proposal on the table right now. Uh, by the governor that would essentially give tribes a veto regarding water rights in Washington state. That is probably not probably it is unconstitutional because water does not belong to other sovereign nations. It belongs to the state of Washington. On top of that, they are looking at limiting household use, tracking potentially household use and outdoor use, at least in some places. And some of this is going to be done by aerial interpretation of water use. You heard that right. In other words, an easement would be granted over your property to fly a drone so they can make sure that you're not using too much water. Again, get involved this session. If that doesn't get you involved, I don't know what will. And that's the briefing. Remember, the antidote to dependency and socialism is to be a God-fearing, self-reliant, freedom-loving American. Thank you to everybody that's been praying for us. Make sure you go to Facebook slash Patriot Radio US. Patriot Radio US. Like the page. Share it with your friends and family. 
And you can always send me a note at Matt at VoteShea, S-H-E-A dot com, Matt at VoteShea dot com. It's going to take all of us. It really is getting out beyond the four walls of the church, getting off our couches to make stuff happen. And it's my pleasure today to introduce once again my guest uh, and friend, former I Sheriff Richard Mack. I can't get Richard a hold of Mar- uh, Okay. I get a voicemail, so I, I'll keep trying. Okay, we'll keep trying. Well, we were trying to get Sheriff Mack on. He's running for Congress, actually, down in the 8th District in Arizona, probably very busy. Um, but also, he had talked about quite a bit what was going on in the Bundy case. And yeah, you know, I wanted to talk to him today about what, you know, this bombshell revelation that had come out in regards to Special Agent Larry Wooten sending a letter to Andrew Goldsmith, the criminal discovery coordinator for the country. And those are all fancy ways of saying that the lead investigator of the Bundy case brought up to the National Criminal Discovery Coordinator that there was alleged impropriety occurring in the Bundy case. Now, Judge Navarro, in the mistrial ruling, cited that memo as one of the reasons. Because there were allegations, I mean, pretty significant allegations of alleged sexual misconduct, of withholding exculpatory evidence or evidence that tends to prove the defense's case across the board, including threat assessments where the Mondays were rated as moderate and low threats because why would they be in jail if they were moderate and low threats, right? Anyway, also the allegations in there that special agent in charge Dan Love kept a kill book and bragged about driving three people to suicide. Now, he's the same guy that was allegedly fired because of the mishandling of evidence in another case. So you have just, I mean, there are so many, so many questions. I mean, just so many questions out of all this. I I don't know how they can continue the case because all of that evidence gets to be brought in in the next trial if there is another trial. And I don't see how the Justice Department under Sessions can allow another trial after they have lost time and again. They lost in Oregon. They lost in Nevada twice, hung juries. And now they've lost again with this mistrial. So I I don't see how you continue down that road. I just don't see how that's justice. It does bring up a a good point, though, that President Trump is going to have to take a look at commuting the sentences of those that made plea agreements because they did so with not all of the information in their hands. So, and I know that, you know, typically the win percentage by prosecutors at the federal level is super high. But that's no excuse to keep going where it's just not justice. You know, I get that you don't want to lose. I get that. But why continue if you're, if it's not just and you had such... If you if if there were such problems on the defense's side, the case would have been solved a long time ago. You know, I, it's always when the on the government side when there's that kind of huge abuse allegations that you have that problem. Matt, I've got him. Okay, so I, I'm glad that uh, Sheriff Mack, you could join us. I hope you're doing well. It's great to have you back on Patriot Radio, my friend. Thanks a lot, Matt. It's always uh, great to be with you. Uh, you're uh, a patriot and a dear friend, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Well, so what is your take, Ben? We'll just jump right in since uh, we lost a little bit of time. But what's your take on the Bundy case? You know, the dismissal now that you know the the mistrial, excuse me, and a dismissal looming, or a mistrial with prejudice looming on January eighth. What, what's your take on all this? 
Well, are any of us surprised? Uh, we've been saying this all along. The Bundy's attorneys have been saying it all along. And uh, anybody who had anything to do with this knew that the federal government was lying. Uh, Jeanette Fenecum obviously has been saying that they've been lying about the death of Lavoy Fenecum. And uh, it appears that they have been fabricating evidence, hiding evidence, uh, hiding exculpatory evidence, which you know is a crime. And uh, now the prosecutors and the judge have been throwing each other under the bus to make sure that the other gets the blame. And Judge Navarro uh, is trying to save face and CYA as best she can after she now has discovered that what the Bundys were saying all along was true, that the federal government lied, fabricated evidence, and uh, basically uh, committed a criminal prosecution. And so uh, when it when it's now to the point that even those involved with the cover-up and those involved with the crimes are now turning on each other, you know that the evidence that they did such is uh, very vivid and uh, it's it's overwhelming evidence. And so they can do. I would recommend if I was talking to. Uh, the federal prosecutors, and anybody that was on the investigation, I would tell every one of them, look, you go to the Bundys and every single person that was arrested at the Bundy Ranch in 2014 or two later, two years later, whenever they finally got around to doing it, uh, for the incident on April 12, 2014, every person you arrested, you go and offer them a deal. We will never prosecute you again if you promise not to sue us, because this is going to cost the government big time, and that is exactly what they should be doing, because I think most of them would now take take that deal. I would tell them not to, because they're going to be very wealthy, and they could put a lot of money into the freedom movement and the patriot community. But seriously, that's what I would tell every FBI agent, every state police officer, and every prosecutor had anything to do with this, you should be offering them everything you possibly could, and maybe even, you know, a little stipend here and there uh, to sweeten the pot. But uh, they should be offering them a deal, say, hey, we won't bother you again. We're sorry. You got your – they're not going to apologize either. But anyway, they should make them that deal. And uh, I think most people would just say, yeah, to, to hell with you. Uh, we don't want to see you again, and uh, we'll, we'll let it go at that. But for people to be in prison two years, on this. And Judge Navarro, that was completely her fault. To deny people bail on this type of a situation uh, is ridiculous. And and so she knows she blew it. The, uh, the prosecutors know they blew it. I believe it's going to be a mistrial, and I don't believe it'll be tried again. You know, I've, I've watched this uh, unfold. And in 15 years, other than what came out with Edward Snowden, these were the most egregious allegations by Special Agent Larry Wooten, the lead investigator, in this memorandum to Andrew D. Goldsmith. It, the most egregious violations that, that I have ever read in, in any court case I've ever seen, been involved with. Um, this was this was just unbelievable, the, the intentional militarization, the withholding of exculpatory evidence that's alleged, the sexual misconduct that was alleged, the kill book that was alleged, all of these things. It, it, it shocks the conscience of, I think, many ordinary Americans. What are folks saying down in your neck of the woods? Um, you know, the mainstreamers aren't saying anything about it. I don't know if they're just not involved and they don't know what's going on. But the very people that were complaining about the Bundys being too radical and, oh, they should just pay their raising fees and who do the guys think they are, and they're just trying to save money, and they're a bunch of radicals. They're not saying anything. They're, you know, even though they have egg all, or, all over their face, they're still not saying anything. And so the, really still it's just people like you and me that are really getting involved in this. But I, I would say this still comes pretty close to what they did at Waco and Ruby Ridge uh, a year apart from each other. Uh, there's some similarities there that are still pretty uh, – drastic and and con and condemning to uh, the federal government but uh, so they did the, they did similar things there I would have to agree with you that this is the worst one I've seen even though Ruby Ridge and Waco came pretty close this one 
was so egregious and so blatant and obvious. Uh, I mean, it's so stupid that they thought they could get away with it because it was just way too obvious from the get-go. Well, it must be one of the reasons I have to presume that you want to go to Congress because this this swamp really does need to be drained and and this mess needs to be cleaned up. Yeah, it does. And there's, you know, there's about seven or eight mainstream Republicans running in the same race, but there's only one constitutional conservative. And so it's, the choice is going to be very clear. And that's actually another reason why I have a chance to win, because all these mainstreamers, even some of them with name recognition, uh, are still going to end with money, are still going to be uh, pulling from the same voter block. And that's the mainstream Republicans. And if I can get the Tea Parties and the Constitutionalists and and the people who are sick and tired of uh, the Republican establishment to uh, come on my side, then I really have a chance to win this, Matt. And uh, we're already getting some pretty good donations. Uh, what I really need is to finish up my signatures, and I only have about seven days left to get signatures, and I'm about 800 still uh, behind on that. So we're trying to mobilize people out here in Arizona uh, who could come out and volunteer. And we're even compensating people uh who want to go get signatures for us, and uh, I'll, I'll pay people for their time. Uh, but, if you know, if I could just get 40 people, 50 people for two days uh, and go get 20 signatures each, we're done. But I've only had four or five volunteers here and there, and I made my youngest son come with me. And so it's it's been long days, uh, and so far we only have 125 signatures, and we need uh, about 1,200 uh, within a week. And so that's really got me nervous at this point. Well, let me ask you a question about the mainstream Republicans um, down there in your neck of the woods. How did they greet your candidacy? Or did they try to ignore you? I mean, what was kind of the tactic they've they've taken yeah. so far? Yeah, the ignoring thing has been something they've done. Uh, they've been really good at. Uh, one of the uh, what would we call her? I guess the mainstream uh, Democrat Republican, you know, the the Republicans that act just like Democrats, um, and some of them have a lot of power and pull. Uh, they got after the first thing that well, Sheriff Mack doesn't even live in the district, you know. Well, you know, you, by law you don't have to. My wife and I've been looking for a home. We're trying to get into that district, but I still see no. Uh, okay, I live in the southeast part of Maricopa County. I really don't see any huge difference between. Southeast Maricopa County and Northwest Maricopa County. They're only 40 minutes apart. Uh, and they, you know, I've lived in Arizona, uh, nine, you know, 85% of my life. Uh, my parents lived in Arizona, 85% of their lives. My grandparents lived in Arizona, 90% of their lives. In fact, that's probably 100% for both of them. And uh, then my great grandparents actually helped settle Arizona in the southern part of the state. So uh, no one has uh, bigger roots than I do in Arizona, and no one understands uh, the Constitution better than I do that are running. So I ask, you know, is it a matter of where you live that qualifies you to be in Congress? So just for, just because you live in the district, you're more qualified than I am? Well, I don't believe that. I don't think anybody else does. And uh, many people have run across the country in in districts they don't uh, live in, and uh, it's just a part of the process. Now, if the law requires me to, I'll, you know, I would have already moved here, but it doesn't, and so my wife and I are uh, looking for homes. In fact, I looked at another one yesterday, and so we are trying to get into the district, but this first election is only two months. Uh, the the primary is in February, uh, February 27th, as a matter of fact. So it's really quick, and, and uh, taking the time to move, uh, taking away from the campaign, you know, my wife might just have to do the move with my kids or something. I do want to live in the district, and I plan to live in the district, but that's really not what uh, makes or breaks a candidate. And as You you know, I, isn't this the place, though, where John McCain, when he first oh, ran, right. didn't live in the district, too, right? Pardon me? Was it, this is the the same state where John McCain, when he originally yeah. ran, didn't live in the district. I remember yeah, that. It, it, yeah, there's a lot of them, you know, and uh, 
I think he started out in Congress and didn't live in the district. But, you know, if you wanted to talk about uh, corrupt politicians, then, you know, McCain, you know, I, I don't wish him any ill will on his illness, but, you know, he was part of the Keating Five and, and uh, money and big money and, and big pharma. He's been part of that. And, you know, it's just a matter of uh, are we going to elect uh, principled people who will follow the Constitution and keep their word to their constituents to oppose and defend the Constitution? I think that's the real issue. It's not what house you live in. Uh, it's, it's what you are as a person and what you believe and what you have done. And that's another thing where I'll, I'll shame, put the other candidates to shame. What have any of them ever done to stand for liberty, uh, the Constitution, or for the little guy who has been abused by government in this country? And, and none of them will be able to give a, a very good answer on that. Well, except for me, of course. Well, what what do you think that you could be able to do your first year in Congress? I mean, how how would you come in, uh, you know, with a hard charge and attitude and, and, and ideas to really change the direction of things? Because Trump is being resisted by, you know, well entrenched bureaucrats. How can you cool. help him get rid of some of those? Well, I would first I would first uh, come out publicly with the good things that President Trump has done. And most recently, and I know you agree with me, he just cut back, uh, what was it, $285 million from dues from the U.N.? And that's probably the most courageous and brilliant step I've ever seen a president take in a long time. Not even Reagan had the guts to do that. And here Trump is doing that. Now, it's a, it's a good first step. It needs to go to where it's 100 percent of the fund. Uh, that we pay to them, but my goodness, a president who finally told the U.N., we're, we're not playing footsie with you, and we're not going to pay you money that you don't deserve, and we're not going to pay 25% of all the money coming into the U.N. anymore. And I would like to see us get out of that, but I am going to compliment the president and tell him I stand firmly behind him in repealing Obamacare and replacing it with nothing, uh, repealing uh, gun control laws, replacing them with nothing, and getting after a lot more of these bureaucracies that have destroyed the lives of Americans, and establishing a, a commission to review the arrests from uh, rogue bureaucrats from the last 10 years, especially those of the IRS and the FDA. Uh, so, uh, and then start uh, a movement to take away law enforcement of, of powers and authorities from federal bureaucrats especially EPA, FDA, uh, DEA, and BLM, and IRS, BLM. Yeah, I mean, we, the longer you and I talk, we're going to come up with more and more and more. But right. uh, that needs to, that, so you can tell I have a lot to do. And, and I'm going to back the president where he has done well. And I'm also going to try to get the president to do a lot more swamp draining than he already has. Now, have you uh, had anybody reach out to you from Washington, D.C., you know, some members of Congress that appreciate what you stand for? Have, have you received any support that way? No, uh, none, none there. Um, I will say that uh, Judge Infalitano, uh was very gracious in, in wishing me well and hoping that I win. Uh, he's not able to give me a public endorsement because of his affiliation with Fox News, uh, but um, uh, I am going to use some quotes that he has said about me before, and uh, Ted Nugent was also very uh, complimentary about my race and wishing me well. So, um, you know, and I wanted to make sure that uh, all of your listeners know, all of them can donate, and uh, my website isn't even up yet. I've only been running for a little over a week now, uh, so we've got people, paid people to try to hurry up and do that. But if anybody wanted to donate, you can do it at cspoa.org and just uh, flag it to the campaign or just make a check to Kevin, Bigley, Arizona, 85236. And if anybody wants that repeated, just give me a call or that same address is on uh, the cspoa.org. Just make, uh, again, mail it to Sheriff Mack for Congress. So in the last couple of minutes that we have, let's talk a little bit about foreign policy. You have um, you've 
share a lot of views uh, of non-interventionism, not isolationism, but non-interventionism. And Correct. President Trump has, has come out recently and said, you know, maybe we don't need to be giving money to the Palestinian Authority uh, or to Pakistan or to other enemies of this country or people that are supporting enemies of this country. What are your right. thoughts on that, and how do you think that's going to be playing out? Well, I think it's it's uh, absolutely correct, and I would uh, echo what Ron Paul said for years, and I'm going to say that too. We are not the world's police. We don't need to pretend to be the world's police. And uh, I'm, I'm all for uh, defending American liberty. But going out into every uh, country and trying to defend and get involved in their civil wars uh, and defend uh, the, the horrible things that are going on in every country— we just can't do that, and we certainly have never done it in Red China, even though there's horrible things going on there. So it seems like if, if the uh, nation has got a huge military, we shy away no matter how bad the abuses are. But if those same abuses are happening in struggling countries or third-world countries where we can dominate, then we go in uh, a lot more willingly. Uh, I don't appreciate that hypocrisy, and I don't appreciate that we've done it. And just about every president in the last 40 years has done it and invaded countries uh, that we shouldn't have. And uh, the Vietnam War should be a very uh, vivid uh, and stark lesson to all of us that government lies about why we go to war, and we just need to uh, stop it. And, uh, you know, if you look at all the wars America's been involved in, especially since we joined the United Nations, then uh, it would, I think it would startle uh, every uh, American citizen and realize that we do it way too often. Well, as we end today, if you could tell the listeners, too, a little bit about CSPOA. Uh, maybe they have uh, a peace officer in their county that they want to connect with that organization and also why it's important for them to be constitutional and peace officers. Well, I, I will still maintain whether I make it to Congress or not that the best solution to America's freedom is county by county and state by state. Uh, is Washington, D.C. is so slow in doing anything and sometimes so corrupt and inept. So I still believe that the, the greatest effort should be with the local community, sheriffs and chiefs of police and, and the local authorities working together to erect the barriers against the encroachments of the federal government. And uh, I believe that I can decrease those from Washington, but uh, the, the greatest defense and the greatest opportunity is at the local level. Every cop should be trained uh, in following the Constitution, and that's exactly what we do at the CSPOA. We train local law enforcement to follow the Constitution, stand for freedom, and protect the citizens from all enemies, both foreign and domestic. It's a great program. Uh, and uh, it's it's working. Uh, we hope to make it bigger, better, and faster, but at the same time, we've got a lot of other work to do as well, and uh, so I hope the people of District 8 in Arizona and Northwest Phoenix will send me to Congress, and, and let's start getting to work on the, a lot of these issues. Well, Sheriff Mack, thank you once again for joining me on Patriot Radio, and I uh, really want to stay in touch. Are you going to be there in Nevada on uh, the 8th? Uh, I don't think so. I've got way too much going on this, and uh, I wish I could, but uh, it's that's just two days from turning in the signatures, and uh, I just don't think I'm going to make it. Gainfully employed. Well, we we just wish you the best. Pray that you're blessed in uh, your run and uh, that you can make a huge difference down there in Arizona in any event, and you already are, and just appreciate everything you're doing for the cause of freedom and liberty. Well, thanks a lot, Matt. And uh, are, are you going to make it there on the 8th? I, I can't make it on the 8th. It's the first day of our legislative session either. So we're oh, both okay. we're both gainfully employed. Well, I, you know, I, I pray, I've prayed for the Bundys every day since uh, the April 12th event in 2014. And uh, I'm still doing it now. And, and uh, we just pray that the Lord's hand will guide that situation and free these people. Amen. Sheriff Richard Mack, CSPOA.org. Thank you again for joining me on Patriot Radio. God bless and take care, okay? See you soon, Matt. Thanks so much. All right. Check them out, CSPOA.org. Also running for Congress down there in Arizona and uh, stepping up. Um, you know, especially after the revelations 
with the Bureau of Land Management. And there, there have been many others that he has cataloged over the years and followed and, and helped out with. But especially with this, this egregious allegations against the, the Bureau of Land Management that gave rise to the mistrial and maybe even a full dismissal here on January 8th. We'll see. But if you get a chance, do check out his organization and – you can get your own local area peace officers involved in that, sheriff, deputies. They can get involved with that. Uh, it's a great organization that keeps people grounded, uh, keeps people focused on the Constitution and upholding their oaths. And I, I think we can all agree on that. I really do. Well, I want to uh, end today again kind of where I began with Ephesians 2 and the idea for all of us. And I, I want, you know, when you get a, I get an opportunity to sit down with your family and read scripture and pray together. We always have a tendency to pray for our needs, but also take that opportunity to pray and declare the truths of God that we are indeed if we're in Christ and Christ is in us seated with him in heavenly places that the things that have been put under his feet are put under our feet if we're in Christ and Christ is in us. That that when we rose up from the grave with him, when he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. And we can discard, we can throw off that old man and not just stop at the cross, but move beyond that. And that really is the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, that we we can not just talk about love, but we can show love. We can disciple, truly disciple about how Christians, whether family or not, can walk closer to God. Well, this is Matt Shea. Thank you once again for joining me on Patriot Radio today. May God bless all of you, and may he make this generation the greatest one.